Boy, it always sounds so nice when somebody else reads off an introduction like that. Um, particularly when it's done in such a, a lovely accent. I, I'm afraid that I cannot offer uh, the dulcet tones of, of uh, Mr. Woodward, but alas, here I am. Um, so first of all, I want to say thank you to the Leadership Institute for the invitation and, and to all of you for showing up uh, to talk about an issue that is near and dear to my heart and uh, I hope near and dear to most of yours as well, which is uh, what tax burdens look like and how they impact uh, the people that we care about uh, at the National Taxpayers Union, of course, the taxpayers. And so uh, it, it, somebody much smarter than I once said that taxes are the fine that you pay for thriving too fast. Um, and luckily, we finally have had a Congress uh, that recognized the impact of the tax code uh, that was actually able to organize an effective reform effort uh, and to, for the first time in a generation, enact a really sort of top to bottom uh, significant reform of our tax code, not just tweaking rates here and there, uh, but doing things to really fundamentally alter the structure of our tax code on both the individual side and on the business side. Uh, that has been a very elusive goal for many of us for quite some time, but uh, ultimately, uh, despite a Congress that often has challenges legislating, uh, even on issues of consensus, it's something that uh, they were able to get done. So. Um, just a little bit of background uh, on the National Taxpayers Union for those of you who don't know. Uh, NTU has been around now uh, since 1969. Uh, it's one of the longer standing organizations uh, that work on, on these policy issues. Um, and the, the introduction gave you a flavor of what it is that we do uh, at NTU. We, we combine policy analysis and research uh, with activism on the ground, you know, in the halls of Congress. Uh, trying to advance the cause of lower, simpler taxes, of spending restraint, of uh, you know, common sense reform to regulations so that we're not strangling businesses. Um, that's the sort of work that we do. Uh, and we, we like to joke that every other business in, and industry and, uh, and interest group in Washington has a lobbyist except for taxpayers. And so uh, we like to say that we're, we are the taxpayers' lobbyist, uh, and it's something that is sorely needed. And so um, I want to talk to you uh, a little bit about what the tax reform bill uh, is, what's in it, what's it, what does it do, what, what kind of impacts might you be able to expect, um, and uh, about how we approached that uh, from our perspective at NTU. But also, ultimately, I want to hear from you. I want to hear what questions you have, what concerns there are, what, uh, what issues you would like to dig into, um, because I, I don't want to sit up here and, and uh, just opine from on high um, and not address the issues that, that people in this room are, are actually going to be caring about and want to focus on. So let's, let's first talk a little bit about, I, I think that there's something that's sort of overlooked in the haze of things, um, is how remarkable uh, the process on this bill really was. <clears throat> we had a, a, in a Congress that is, as we've said, not known for uh, being able to effectively legislate on a regular basis, certainly on issues that are important to us outside of tax reform. And yet, uh, we have a bill that was introduced, H.R. 1, the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, was introduced in the House on November the 2nd, 2017. Uh, it was ultimately passed by the House by a vote of 227 to 205 on November the 16th. Uh, the Senate took a little bit longer, but uh, ultimately was agreed to in the Senate by a vote of 51 to 49 on December the 2nd. Uh, the conference committee between the two of those uh, ultimately resolved all of the differences. There were some back and forth, but by December the 20th, uh, and the president signed the bill by December 22nd. So we have, in the span of less than two months, uh, now there were years of work that went into this ahead of time. Uh, this was not, you know, nobody was sitting down for the first time and thinking about tax reform on November the 2nd. But uh, in terms of legislative process, that is really quite remarkable that we had in the span of less than two months, both chambers moving through regular order, uh, through their respective committees, uh, resolving differences in conference. Um, you know, that, that's something, even the conference process alone is something that's relatively rare these days. For those of you who are followers of 
of the legislative process these days, it's much more common to have what we call a ping pong, where uh, one chamber will pass a bill and the other chamber, rather than passing its own and then having to hash out the differences, will just pick up and pass the, uh, the bill that the other chamber uh, passed identically so as to avoid having to do uh, a, a conference process. So in less than two months, through regular order, through respective committees, to the floor, with appropriate amendments, uh, you know, through a conference process, and signed by the president in less than two months. I think that is a remarkable achievement. Uh, I think it's one that we will look back upon in this sort of uh, sea of difficulty in terms of legislating in Congress, and we will scratch our heads and wonder how in the heck did they do that? Um, but, uh, but they did, and so, and lucky for us that they did. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what is what is in the tax reform bill? What does it do? Um, <clears throat> obviously, there's a, a heck of a lot of detail that uh, we won't be able to dig into given the short time that we have today. But broadly speaking, starting on the individual side, uh, the first thing and the thing that I, I hope and expect that most of you will notice when you file your taxes uh, this, this year is you will see there are uh, reductions and simplifications to the rate structure. So. Uh, most notably, the top individual income tax rate was reduced from 39.6% down to 37%. Uh, but the brackets below that one, too, where most folks uh, who pay income tax are, of course, not getting to the top bracket, which uh, requires income of roughly half a million dollars or more. Uh, so most folks are paying in the, in the rates uh, quite a bit lower than that. Uh, but there are reductions virtually across the board there. The 15% bracket is now a 12% bracket. The 25% bracket is now a 22% bracket. The 28% bracket is now a 24% bracket, and so on. Uh, and so in, in each one of these cases, we have uh, a, a lower rate, and the bands uh, of income in which uh, those apply have been changed as well. Uh, and that's going to deliver significant benefits to folks when they are filing their taxes, they are going to see a smaller cut taken out uh, when they do so. Um, at the same time, what Congress did is they increased the standard deduction uh, to $12,000 for single filers, so they virtually doubled it uh, for single filers and $24,000 for joint filers. Uh, so that means that $24,000 worth of income, you can lop right off the top. Um, and that, combined with some of the other simplifications that Congress made, is going to mean that many, many, many fewer people are actually going to be itemizing and, and having to go through the various credits and deductions and stack up the receipts and fill out the you know 15 extra forms. Uh, that's really what drives most of income tax complexity. What this bill will do is it will make economic sense for many more people, upwards of 95% of people, uh, to simply take the standard deduction so you figure out what your adjusted gross income is based on the W-2 that you have or, or uh, what have you. Uh, take the standard deduction from that, um, apply the rates as you know, they're described in the rate tables, and that's the end of it. Uh, and so that's going to dramatically simplify the filing process for the vast majority of filers. Uh, the folks who are going to continue itemizing are, ten are going to tend to be folks that are, are wealthier, higher income, who have very complex tax situations, who have you know, perhaps very large mortgages where they're uh, writing off mortgage interest, what have you. Um, but that, that increased standard deduction is, uh, it's but one provision in the whole bill, but it is arguably one of the most important provisions in the whole bill, because that combined with some of these other simplifications will mean uh, many fewer people are having to do the difficult, uh, frustrating work of itemizing and, and having to deal with receipts and the like. Um, it, it does a great deal to modify, eliminate, change uh, credits and deductions uh, to simplify the tax code. It doesn't do as much as I would like. I'm sort of a tax policy purist. I'd like to see a world in which we have uh, very few, perhaps if any, uh, credits and deductions for various different activities. But nonetheless, uh, especially given the circumstances, this bill makes significant advances in terms of uh, modifying credits and deductions in order to simplify the code, in order to eliminate some of the distortions that are inherent uh, in those credits and deductions. Um, I won't name off every single one, but I'll give you a, a, some of the highlights. 
Um, so perhaps most notably, it, it retains the charitable contribution uh, deduction, which is something that's important to a lot of folks, of course, uh, who, who believe very much in uh, charitable contributions and uh, the ability to, to deduct that from your taxes. Um, it makes a, a relatively modest change in the grand scheme of things to the mortgage interest deduction. Uh, what it does is it limits the mortgage interest deduction to the first $750,000 uh, in principal value. Um, to give you some context, uh, the median home value in the United States is something like $239,000. Uh, and so even in the highest cost areas, Washington DC is a very uh, high you know, expensive area to purchase housing in places like San Francisco, New York, what have you. Uh, even in places like that, uh, being able to deduct mortgage interest up to $750,000 means that everyone uh, up to the median and, and in most places significantly above will be able to deduct all of their mortgage interest. And of course, wealthier folks who have you know, jumbo loans and, and uh, larger homes and what have you will continue to be able to deduct up to that $750,000 level. Um, so that's a relatively modest change. I think that some of us would have liked to see a phase out of the mortgage interest deduction entirely or, or uh, other sorts of uh, policies that would have been more aggressive in, in that process. But uh, nonetheless, that is a, a, a relatively significant change. Um, the one that you may have heard the most about uh, is a limitation on the deduction for state and local taxes that are paid. Uh, previously, it was the case that you could deduct uh, all of the uh, local either income or sales and property taxes that, uh, that you paid. Um, what this bill does is it limits that to $10,000 combined uh, in tax burdens. And the reason that it does this is that we have, for decades now, had these very high tax states, places like New York and California and Illinois, uh, that have uh, found it easier to raise taxes on their constituents uh, because they know that those tax burdens can be deducted on federal returns. Um, you know, nobody is quite so explicit as saying that, but uh, just as an example, as we were doing some of our historical research uh, during the, the tax reform process and dealing with the, the state and local tax deduction and other things, um, uh, many of you may be familiar with the landmark property tax reform in California, Proposition 13, uh, which is something that has saved taxpayers billions of dollars in the, uh, what, nearly 40 years of its existence uh, at this point. There were folks who argued against uh, passage of Proposition 13 because of the deductibility of state and local taxes. They said, well, you know, don't do this because if we have higher taxes, we can just deduct it against our, our federal returns. Uh, and so we're gonna be, you know, doing our state a disservice if we, uh, if we enact a property tax limitation like Proposition 13. And so the deductibility of state and local taxes has been a significant contributor to growth in tax burdens uh, in states, places like New Jersey, New York, California, et cetera. Uh, and so having this limitation in place where you can, uh, you can deduct up to $10,000 worth, um, and so that's really going to cover the vast majority of, of folks who are uh, you know, middle income uh, and lower. Um, having that limitation in place is, I, I think, a significant advance toward uh, making those high tax states bear the burden of their high taxes themselves. And if they want to continue making decisions that, that you know, places, a place like California with a top income tax rate of 13.3%, uh, if they want to continue making choices that, that those sorts of tax burdens make sense for them, that they can do so, but that their taxpayers uh, will bear the full burden of that. And we think that that's going to drive some significant tax competition between states. You're already starting to hear... Uh, uh, well, what's the word? Whining, perhaps, um, from some of these blue state governors and legislators uh, about what the impact of this limitation is going to do, what this is going to have, what impact this is going to have uh, on their tax and budget processes. Um, you know, places that were considering, you know, new surtaxes on millionaires or other sorts of things. Um, you know, they've they've started to rethink this and realize that. The new paradigm after the passage of this bill means that they cannot be so cavalier as to raise these taxes with the understanding that, that folks will just be able to deduct it uh, when they file their federal returns. Um, it, uh, it, this, this bill expands, it, it doubles the child tax credit, uh, which is something that folks who believe in 
the value of, of family and, uh, and the you know, nurturing and, and creation of families uh, is important. Um, it, it, so it expands that from $1,000 to $2,000. That's going to be uh, a significant impact, of, co of course, for folks who have children. Uh, and the first now $1,400 of that is uh, what we call refundable. What that means is that uh, you can actually have a, a negative tax burden. Um, you can you know, receive a, a payment back if your income is low enough. Um, and so that, that functions as a, a, a support, obviously, for, uh, for children and also um, as sort of a, a smarter and less complicated way of pro providing uh, the sort of support that a lot of folks would like to for lower income folks. Um, the uh, one other thing that you may have heard a, a thing or two about uh, in this process is that uh, this bill repeals the individual mandate that you remember from Obamacare fame. Uh, what it does is it lowers that penalty amount uh, to zero dollars. And so uh, the Supreme Court in its infinite wisdom decided that the individual mandate was a legitimate exercise of Congress's taxing power. Uh, and so the 115th Congress uh, decided that they should exercise Congress's taxing power by reducing that burden to zero. Uh, so the individual mandate is no more. Um, this is an interesting inclusion for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, it, it gave some sort of breathing room, I guess you could say, uh, in the process of trying to keep this bill, the, the cost of this bill, the revenue impact of this bill. Uh, below the $1.5 trillion target that Congress had set for itself uh, and that ultimately would have to be uh, enforced. Um, but by creating this breathing room, it also created some, some challenges. Um, and we can dig into that a little bit more later. But, uh, but by challenges, I mean that if you look at uh, the Joint Committee on Taxation, which is the, uh, the entity that is tasked with scoring the impact of tax bills, uh, when they run the impact of the individual mandate, uh, it, it looks as though there are tax increases for people particularly of lower incomes um, when on paper, if you just sort of take a glance at these uh, scores, it, it looks as though there are tax increases. And you think to yourself, why? What, what would that be? We're talking about a bill where we're reducing tax rates and doubling the child tax credit and, and doubling the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Doubling the um, standard deduction, and you know how, how is how could this be? Um, the oddness of JCT scoring conventions are such that uh, that the individual mandate's disappearance uh, means that there are a lot of folks who will choose not to purchase insurance. Uh, will choose. I should clarify. Will choose not to purchase overpriced, expensive insurance that taxpayers are then required to subsidize. Uh, and so because people will be making that you know, choice of their own free will uh, to not purchase overpriced uh, expensive insurance that taxpayers are required to subsidize, uh, what it looks like is as though that person raised their taxes by you know, however many hundred or thousand dollars um, that would be associated, that would be the subsidy that would flow to them uh, if they were to choose to purchase this insurance. Um, so it, it led to some uh, peculiarities, but ultimately, um, you know, obviously we, th as a, an organization, I'm sure I, I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, that would like to repeal Obamacare. Um, we, we're happy to see the inclusion of the repeal of the individual mandate and think that it, it ultimately did help to get this bill across the finish line. Um, let's talk about a, a few uh, other things. So the alternative minimum tax, this sort of dreaded alternative minimum tax. Um, ultimately, both chambers wanted to get to a place where they eliminated the alternative minimum tax entirely. Um, sadly, sort of the, the last moments because of uh, the conventions on the Senate floor of having to deal with uh, the, the so-called Byrd rule, and um, we, again, we can get into details on that. Uh, ultimately, they weren't able to uh, completely eliminate the alternative minimum tax. Um, but what they did is they increased uh, the exemption for that uh, pretty substantially, and they increased the phase-out threshold uh, of that pretty substantially, too. So what that means in practice is that many fewer people are going to be impacted by the alternative minimum tax. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, the alternative minimum tax is uh, is now a, a decades-old mechanism. It's intended to uh, prevent sort of tax evasion by by wealthy filers uh, by effectively establishing a minimum tax threshold uh, 
Um, and it's not quite as simple as that, would that it were so. Um, but uh, what it does is it basically creates a second tax code, uh, a second tax code where there are fewer credits and deductions. Um, and so you're, you're able to do less to reduce your tax burdens. Um, so the alternative minimum tax is not gone, uh, but it is, it is certainly diminished uh, very significantly. So the last important thing I'll mention on the individual side, and then I'll move on to the business side, um, is that uh, unfortunately, again, this is because of the conventions of, of scoring and, and of Congress and the Senate we can get into, uh, we'll get into in a moment. Um, the majority of these changes that I've just described to you are actually temporary provisions. They are not permanent. Um, they will expire on December 31st, 2025, absent some action by Congress. Now, I think that all of us expect, and I'd be willing to lay down a bet if, uh, if anyone wants to uh, disagree with me, that, that the majority of those provisions, if not all of them, but certainly the majority of those provisions will be either extended you know, additionally or made permanent uh, by the time that expiration date in 2025 happens. Um, but uh, nonetheless, they are, not, uh, they are not in the bill permanent. Uh, so let's talk about the business tax side. We've talked about the individual tax side. I think that, uh, you know, that, that was obviously a, a, a big success in being able to simplify, being able to make it so that more people can take the standard deduction, uh, you know, rid themselves of the frustration of dealing with itemization. Rates are lower, expanded child tax credit, et cetera. There's a lot, a, a lot good on the individual side. Um, let's talk about the business side, which is arguably the bigger sort of triumph uh, in, in this tax bill. Um, so the, the top line number that everybody knows is that uh, what this bill does, and it does so permanently, and it does so immediately, so today, this is the law of the land, uh, it lowers the corporate income tax rate to 21%. So let's give some context on what that means. We were, uh, at, certainly after movements from several other countries that were uh, joining us in our, our lonely quest to be the uh, highest corporate income tax rate in the world, the United States is the highest corporate income tax in the developed world. And it, and it wasn't even particularly close. You see all of these very high tax, uh, you know, uh, countries that are, shall we say, not pro-business uh, in Europe and elsewhere who had significantly lower corporate income tax rates than the United States. Uh, what that meant is that it was tremendously difficult for uh, businesses to make, businesses that are making rational investment decisions to choose to make the decision to invest uh, in the United States given uh, the, the high cost and the complexity of our corporate income tax code. Um, and so having a 21% rate uh, puts us not quite, you know, it's, it's not the, the lowest, um, but it puts us near the front of the pack. It, it, that's blunted, that impact is blunted a little bit when you add in the four, it's about four and a half percent average uh, state corporate income tax rates that, of course, would apply for businesses that, uh, that operate here in the United States. Um, but that puts us uh, near the front of the pack uh, when we're talking about, uh, when we're looking at the competition between countries um, and trying to establish corporate income tax rates that make sense uh, and that foster the kind of investment that we want to see. Um, the other important change that this bill has in it is uh, it, it transitions us from what we used to call a, a worldwide uh, taxation system to a territorial taxation system. What that means is previously, uh, under the law, uh, we would tax income earned by American corporations uh, regardless of where their operation uh, was that, that generated that income. And so say you're a, a General Electric and you are operating some, I don't know, some production plant in, in France or wherever. Uh, our corporate income tax code previously would extend the reach of uh, American uh, tax authorities to that activity that occurs overseas. And we were, again, among the only developed countries to utilize this system. Virtually everyone else utilized this so-called territorial system where we're taxing income that is generated and derived from activities that are, are taking place domestically. Um, so we have now put ourselves uh, in line with the rest of the world in having a territorial system uh, that's gonna do a, a great deal to eliminate a lot of these, you hear a lot about these complicated 
you know, the double Dutch Omaha jump shot. I mean, I don't even know what all the names are, but you hear about uh, all of these various tax, uh, tax sort of avoidance, uh, legal tax avoidance largely, but uh, tax avoidance that we, we have effectively forced businesses into. We have forced businesses into complicated backflips to try to avoid excessive taxation from American tax authorities uh, because we had a rate that was too darn high and we had a system that extended the reach no matter where uh, these businesses were operating. So we have, we have fixed that uh, and we have done so permanently. Um, and I, I, if you have paid attention to uh, the, the news clippings and the like, um, boy, has it been delicious to hear, uh, hear the consternation in countries like Germany, uh, even places like China, who are worried about what the impact on their country is going to be from a suddenly competitive American tax code. Because if you're uh, a business that's looking to make investment decisions or, or how to uh, you know, build that next plant or whatever it might be, uh, you know what? The United States is actually a pretty good uh, place to invest nowadays because we have a uh, competitive tax code. We have rates that put us, again, near, not at, but near the front of the pack in terms of developed countries. And oh, by the way, we are the largest economy in the world uh, and have obviously a huge number of consumers and an educated workforce and, uh, and what have you. So that is a game changer. And you can see how game changing it is by looking at, uh, at, at how concerned and worried uh, some of our friends in Europe and elsewhere are. Um, so w some of the other changes on the business side, and this there's a lot of uh, uh, complexity here that we won't be able to get into, um, but what this bill does is it allows full and immediate expensing of sort of short-lived capital investments for the first uh, five years. So what that means is businesses that are making decisions to invest in equipment or uh, whatever it might be can write that off on their tax bill right away rather than having to go through the complicated depreciation schedules of, okay, well, this thing lost 10% of its value this year and 8% of its value that year. And you, know, you have to, uh, in some cases, stretch these out over the course of decades uh, before you're recovering the cost that you've incurred uh, for making an investment in your business, what we've done is for a, uh, for a set of short-lived investments at least, and, and for five years, we've allowed people to write that off immediately, to recover those costs immediately. That's a big deal. And if you look at how the scoring uh, looks on these bills, um, that's the provision that, that on its own probably uh, has the biggest bang for the buck, so to speak, um, because that does a lot to encourage additional investment. Um, it also uh, uh, increases the so-called Section 179 expensing cap from a half a million to a million dollars. Um, it does other things like limiting the deductibility of net interest uh, expenses to 30% of earnings, uh, earnings before interest, um, uh, taxes, depreciation, amortization, EBITDA, everybody's favorite, uh, everybody's favorite acronym. Um, and uh, it, it makes several other changes. Perhaps most notably, uh, it eliminates the uh, domestic production uh, deduction, the Section 199 uh, deduction, which was something that a lot of businesses benefited from, uh, but was sort of traded away in favor of lower rates uh, and a simpler code. Um, and then in terms of international stuff writ large, um, what it does is we have Famously, there's, what, $2 trillion or so uh, that are parked overseas um, that businesses are not bringing back to America to make investments in, in workforce or, or you know, plants or what have you. And the reason they're not doing that is because of the tax penalty that they would have to pay because of the uh, you know, excessive American tax rates. It made more financial sense for them uh, to try to keep these dollars overseas and invest them in other ways. Um, what this bill does by one, shifting to that territorial system, <clears throat> and two, uh, it, it enacts what is called a deemed repatriation rate. Um, what it does is they say, uh, we're, we're going to, for those dollars that are held overseas, uh, we're going to tax that at a rate of 15.5% uh, for cash and, and cash equivalents uh, and 8% for reinvested earnings. And then you can do what you want with it. If you want to bring it back, Great, you know, thumbs up. If not, you can leave it there. But 
effectively what it means is if you're a business that you've just been taxed 15.5% on cash that you held overseas, well, you've now been given effectively a 15.5% uh, repatriation rate to bring those dollars back. And so you're already starting to hear about businesses making uh, moves toward additional investments as a result of, of that component of the bill. Um, the, the last thing, well, last two things I'd mention um, <clears throat> is uh, one is a sort of, I should have mentioned the individual section, but um, the, uh, the dreaded death tax um, was something that I think a lot of us uh, would have liked to see these bills eliminate entirely uh, because it is a, an unfair uh, element of double taxation in our code. Um, it raises relatively little revenue uh, for the negative impact that it has on our economy um, and for the compliance costs and, and what have you. Um, unfortunately, we were not able to secure uh, elimination of the death tax, but we uh, maybe wounded it uh, a little bit. The, uh, the estate tax exemption has been doubled, and so now uh, if you have an estate that's worth $11.2 million or less, uh, you will not have to pay the estate tax. Now, let's be clear that there are going to be a lot of folks who still have to file death tax returns uh, just to figure out that they don't have a death tax liability around that uh, limit. And so it's not quite so simple. You know, It's not like if you spend down uh, $100,000 or something right before you uh, meet your maker that, that you'll uh, escape exactly all of the complexity of it. But, uh, but the exemption uh, has increased, and now the exemption will, will increase with inflation, um, which is important. Uh, but that caveat, that also expires in December of 2025, along with a lot of those other individual provisions. Um, the last thing I'd mention, and then I want to I wanna get people's thoughts and questions, and we can sort of uh, generate the discussion from there, um, is... Uh, what this bill did, and this was a big sort of debate, um, for uh, pass-through entities. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar, when we refer to pass-throughs, we're talking about uh, sole proprietorships and, and LLCs and other kinds of structures where uh, individuals who operate businesses end up paying tax on the income derived from that business through their individual tax returns. Not They don't pay your ordinary sort of C Corp uh, corporate income tax. And uh, so those are, are folks that faced very high rates, of course, uh, before, because if you were a sole proprietorship and you generated, uh, let's say, a, a million and a half dollars in income, uh, and you're in the state of California, what that means is that previously you were paying a 39.6% individual income tax rate. Uh, that if there were any uh, capital gains or dividends that were associated with that, the net investment income tax was added on top of that, uh, another 3.8%. That would mean that you would face California's top income tax rate of 13.3%. Um, and so you can see just how punitive this was for people who were sole proprietorships, LLCs, generally small businesses, but folks that employ the majority of American workers. Uh, and so that one of the goals of tax reform is how can we reduce tax burdens on these pass-through entities, on these generally smaller businesses. Um, ultimately, what Congress came up with is they created a 20% deduction uh, for pass-through income. And so, uh, if you're you know that sole proprietorship or what have you, um, if you meet the qualifications, we can get into the details of exactly what the qualifications are. If folks want. Um, but you would be eligible for a 20% deduction, uh, which helps to uh, obviously take down those rates um, pretty significantly and, and make it so that you can be uh, more competitive and have to deal with you know, less complexity and, uh, and high tax burdens. And so, um, so that's sort of a, a broad description of what the bill is. And I, I want to I start with maybe a survey, if I can. Uh, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. Um, for folks in this room, how many people think or thought that this bill would be likely to raise their tax burdens at the end of the day? Anybody? We got one. Anyone else? Two. Okay. Let me, let me ask. I'm just curious. What, what made you worry? You don't have to, I, Well, to the extent that you're comfortable without revealing sensitive financial details about your personal life. Um, what is it that made you concerned that this bill uh, would raise your taxes? I'll, I'll start with you. Okay. 
Are you are you in one of those dreaded blue states? Yeah. Um, and what about you, sir? Okay, so for those of you who didn't hear, um, we had two gentlemen who said that they were concerned after running the numbers through calculators and the like um, that the loss of the deduction for state and local taxes, the loss of uh, potentially the, the deduction for mortgage interest is something that they were concerned would offset any reduction in rates and what impact that would have on them. Um, so not having any of your financial details in front of me um, and wanting to limit my financial liability as a result, I'd be willing to bet you both, say, $50, uh, if you were up for it, um, that when the time comes for you to file your taxes, that you will actually see a lower burden than you would if it were calculated under the previous law. Um, and I'll tell you why. Uh, that for virtually everyone, not literally everyone, you can, there's no tax bill in this world you can design that will reduce every single person's tax bill by something. It is, it is a virtual impossibility. There will always be uh, somebody who has an anachronistic, you know, sort of weird uh, income structure or tax structure, or what have you. Um, but I'll tell you why I'm not worried for you, um, which is that unless, unless you are newly purchasing a home, so everybody who has a mortgage today uh, can continue to deduct interest uh, in full under previous law. So if you own a home today already, um, and you're not making a purchase right here and now, um, you, you will already be able to deduct uh, your mortgage interest as you were before. So I bought a home in June of 2017. Um, and my interest will continue to be deductible up to the full extent of what the previous law was before. Uh, so anybody who owns a home today is, is unaffected. So that's one thing that makes me less worried for you. Um, yes, sir. Uh, well, we're talking about two things. We're talking about the mortgage interest deduction and the state and local tax deduction. So what I'm saying is for the mortgage interest part, for the part that you pay interest on your home mortgage, you get to deduct that. Uh, anybody who has an existing home is unaffected by that. It's only for new purchases that folks make. And even then, you're able to deduct interest all the way up to $750,000. So $750,000 of mortgage interest is roughly a $900,000 home. Uh, if you're, you know, assuming standard down payments. So you can get the sense that virtually everyone will be unaffected, and even the folks that are affected, folks who have houses that are, are worth more than $900,000 and are making purchases now, um, that they'll still be able to deduct everything up to $750,000. So if you had an $800,000 mortgage, you'd be able to, you know, deduct virtually all of that. Um, so that's one thing that makes me fear for you a little less uh, than I would otherwise. Um, the other thing that I would say is on the state and local tax deduction. Um, that is no doubt going to have a significant impact, uh, particularly on people in those high tax states. Um, if you're limiting the ability to deduct that at $10,000, that can have a, a significant impact. Um, but the, the, if you run sort of just those numbers on the, on the state and local tax deduction part through the various income ranges, virtually everyone sees more benefit from the rate reduction than they do from the limitation on, uh, uh, on the state and local tax uh, component. Um, now, I say virtually everyone, which is why maybe I'd lose $50 if we actually made that bet. I don't know. Um, but I, I think that one of the fascinating things and frustrating things about this tax reform process was uh, exactly how, uh, just how poor a job the media did in describing the impacts of the bill um, and in describing how it would be likely to apply to a broad range of people. Um, and that generated a lot of these poll results where you saw, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 percent of people who believed that they were going to see a tax increase after this bill uh, was passed. And, and you can imagine that folks were, of course, concerned about that. But the, the reality is that uh, it's in the, roughly in the range of 90 percent of people we'll see a tax reduction. And that 10% uh, tend to be uh, very, high, very, very high income folks who will continue to be impacted by the AMT and the like. Uh, we're talking people who earn tens of millions of dollars 
Um, so very, very high income folks. And then there's sort of a, a band of people who are just over that line of itemizing and thus, you know, are able to get uh, significant benefit from, you know, credits and deductions before. And now that those credits and deductions have been limited, um, people who are right on that line of, of itemizing under this bill, uh, it's, it's possible that they would see some sort of impact. So, um, so the reason I asked that question is because there was just this uh, I don't think it was outright dishonest I exactly as much as it was just ill-informed that we have uh, a bunch of even tax and business reporters who just don't understand how this stuff tends to work and, and haven't taken the, the care to uh, determine how this stuff works. Um, and they gave people a false impression about what the impact of this bill uh, would be on them. And so um, we're obviously hopeful, uh, as I'm sure folks in Congress are who worked on this, that uh, when the time comes to actually file taxes, that there are going to be a lot of folks who are going to be pleasantly surprised when they realize that they're going to save significant amounts of money um, compared to, to what their impact was before. A question in the back, ma'am. Uh, I have a friend at the Tax Foundation who told me that it made it... They want me to use the mic. Okay. A friend at the Tax Foundation said that getting a bill that would be effective and efficient and so forth was much complicated by the bird <coughs> rule. I believe one of the complications was that businesses could, in the end, there was a big debate about whether you could depreciate over 30 or 39 years for business prop, uh, real property, because residential went to 30, but business didn't. Do you think we have a chance of reforming the bird rule, or are we stuck with it? as long as we can see out on the horizon, and do you know anything about that 30 to 39 year difference on uh, business property? Thank you. That's a, a great question. Um, first, let me say if, if uh, we have time issues or anything, just somebody give me a wave, if you would. Um, but uh, so. We have a little five minutes. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so to answer first your question on the bird rule, um, just a quick explanation of what's the bird rule. Uh, the Byrd rule is a, a, a Senate procedure, <clears throat> excuse me, where uh, the Senate now has a rule that it says that a bill cannot have a negative deficit impact outside of the 10-year window, so in years 11, 12, 13, et cetera. Um, and the reason it does that is obviously for, for trying to minimize uh, deficit impact of, of any bill. Um, inside the 10-year window, we have JCT and CBO that produce scores that theoretically, although we have lots of quibbles, um, that theoretically show you what the impact is. But the Bird Rule says we can't have an impact outside the 10-year window. Um, and it has some other impacts too. But um, to answer your question, uh, briefly, I think the answer is probably no, that there's not any real ability to undo the Bird Rule in the near future. Um, it would take... Uh, much more significant Republican majorities to be able to have uh, those changes made in the Senate. We now only have a Republican majority of 51 to 49 uh, in the Senate as of today. Um, and so I don't, I think the bird rule is here to stay for now. Um, and I think that Congress needs to legislate within the bounds of what the bird rule says. Now, there are ways that you can do that, and there are ways that maybe they ought to have done a better job, frankly, with this bill. Um, the, the second question, if I'm, if I'm sure I'm understanding you, um, one of the things that I think tax nerds like me were most excited about in the beginning was the notion of having full expensing, so ability to have full cost recovery on physical structures. Um, so what we're talking about here is I, I'm, you know, wealthy industrialist X, and I want to build a plant to produce a widget that uh, previously we had depreciation structures that were as long as 39 years for physical structures like that. So it would take me 39 years to get back the cost that I would put in on an investment like that. Um, we were excited about being able to have full expensing of that. Um, and we were surprised and disappointed that at the very last stage of the bill, in the conference process, because the House had this provision in and, uh, and the Senate made improvements, but at the very last minute, because of the Bird Rule, effectively, um, that provision was stripped out. So one of the most pro-growth provisions, sort of single provisions, even though it seems like a small thing, um, was ultimately left on the cutting room floor because of the bird rule. So we produced uh, a report at the National Taxpayers Union Foundation, one of my colleagues, about the bird rule, uh, about the impact of it, 
um, about what sort of difficulties it presented in the bill. And let's make no mistake about it, the Byrd rule made this bill worse. It made this bill significantly worse than it needed to be. Uh, and even from the perspective, and this is from the perspective of somebody who cares about debt and deficits, uh, and who thinks that they are a problem and wants to work on, on restraining spending um, and wants to make sure that we're not blowing a hole in the debt. Uh, this bill was made worse by the impact uh, of the Bird Rule, and I don't think that the impact of the Bird Rule did anything significantly to change uh, its, uh, you know, the picture as it relates to the debt. So um, that was a definite uh, frustration. All right, I, th I think maybe we'll have time for, for one more, um, so I'll, I'll go to this side. Uh, Larry. Do we have to wait to 2025 to get fixes? And what are the fixes? I know 529s don't go to homeschoolers, for instance. Things yeah. they say they're going to fix. What are like the top 10 fixes that we should do, and how soon can we do them? Ooh, top 10 fixes. Um, it would probably take me longer than the uh, minute or two that I'll answer this question <clears throat> to both think of and, and uh, explain some of those. But um, I think the answer is no, we don't have to wait until 2025 to fixes. Uh, to do fixes. I think there will be some that might be necessitated earlier than that. You're already s seeing some of these high tax blue states trying to figure out what's a cheeky way that we can restructure our tax code to be able to benefit from the state and local tax deduction. So one example is they've said, well, what if you just made, uh, you know, the, you, you would make a, a $10,000 tax payment and then beyond $10,000, the rest of what you would pay to the state would be a charitable contribution to the state. So out of the goodness of your heart, you'd give the next, you know, ten or $20,000 or whatever it is to the state because charitable contributions are still deductible. Um, and so you're already seeing states coming up with, with silliness like this. Um, it's not at all unlikely that Congress will have to come back and say, no, New York or California or New Jersey, you can't do something as foolish as that. Um, Although if you'd like to make taxes voluntary, hey, we can have a conversation. Um, but uh, so there are some changes like that that I think um, might be necessitated. And then the things that you're talking about are things that were left on that cutting room floor that we'd like to get, that things like expensing of, of physical structures, things like Larry mentioned, uh, the uh, ability to use 529s or tax-free college savings plans, uh, education savings plans rather, um, for people who are homeschooled. Uh, it's another thing that was left on the cutting room floor at the very, very last stage of the bill um, that is something that is good policy uh, that Senator Cruz championed that we would like to see passed into law. Um, so there are things like that that I think people will try to get additional bites at the apple. Um, and if nothing else, you'll see that be a theme. And then when we have that discussion come 2025, we probably will have a package of changes that uh, make some of that you know, permanent or extensions and make some of those changes that we'd like to see. Um, with that, I want to make sure I don't uh, take up any more, more time, but um, I want to thank you for the opportunity. I hope this was not too eye glazing. Um, and if there are questions or, or anything, I'm happy to stick around and talk to folks after. Thank you.